So today I went to the grocery store, pick up a few items. I didn't really need to. I just wanted to check on how things were going. That's a good place to go when you want to know the barometer of what's going on in your community. When you want to see the condition your community is actually in. And things were much worse than they were Saturday when I went shopping last. But first, I want to talk to you about something that happened at work. Got into a heated discussion with uh, somebody, and I've always said this in many videos. Some people will argue to the death. Knowing that they're wrong, they will argue to the death to be right and could never care, could care less about being correct. There is a difference between being right and correct. <clears throat> the conversation was between two gentlemen one of which looks like maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago, he might have graduated from college. And he is having a discussion with somebody else and they got into a little bit of a conversation about, well, you know, businesses, we need to raise taxes on businesses. They're not paying their fair share. I didn't think nothing of it, you know, I didn't have my opinion. But then he did something that he shouldn't have done. He looked at me and gave me a nod as though he was looking for my input. Well, I sometimes have a problem controlling my mouth. Uh, not perfect. I put in my two cents because they were complaining about those rich business owners. I hate that. I looked at him right in front of everybody. Try getting a job from a poor person. Let me know how that works out for you. I got that zombie look. Well, the businesses don't pay any taxes. I said, listen, you can vote for higher taxes. You can vote to raise minimum wage. But what you're doing is voting for your own price increases. You're voting for your own tax increases. I don't know what you're talking about. When you vote to raise somebody's taxes, businesses, they pass down the cost of doing business to the products that they sell. Then he got all flustered and angry. You're oversimplifying it. You're oversimplifying it. There's all kinds of decisions and it depends on the business and it depends on the size of the business. There's all kinds of decisions that need to be made. You're oversimplifying it. Meanwhile, he would never mention any of the de final decisions after you come out of the boardroom. None of the decisions that they would have a choice of. Because really, there's only about five or six decisions that you would have a choice of. I don't care where the meeting was held at. I don't care if it was in a freaking luncheon room, a bathroom, or a boardroom. You only have so many choices to mitigate extra cost of doing business. And he wasn't having any of that. No, you're oversimplifying it. And I was calm up until the point where he started making up business terminology. Oh, tax taxpayer has a degree in business. He started making up words. I kid you not, no different than somebody in the fourth grade. Well, the, the, the front face decision, and I looked, I stopped him. What, do you, what, what, what is a front face decision? Well, well, yeah. And he got madder and madder, and he couldn't understand that. The cost of doing business is the cost of doing business. Anything that is associated with running a business is termed the cost of doing business. Whether it's the striping in the parking lot, the ceiling fan and the lights, or the air conditioner, or the cost that you buy your goods at. Those get passed down to the consumer, I tried to explain to him. He's getting angrier and angrier. He wouldn't have any of it. I'm oversimplifying it. And he, he kept going back to this, well, in the boardroom, there's all kinds of variables and decisions. And I know. You can have whatever words being traded back and forth in the boardroom. But once you leave the boardroom, you only have a handful of options to mitigate the cost of doing business. There's only a handful, maybe, maybe seven. 
Let me go over a few of them with you. To mitigate the cost of doing business, you raise the prices of the goods that you sell. Well, that means the business owner isn't paying for it. The consumer is. You. You can lay off workers. You can cut their hours. You can close your business. You can close your business and move out of state. You can close your business and move out of country. You can find a cheaper vendor, but chances are most businesses already do that. I'll give it an eighth option. Your eighth option is maybe a combination of all the options. He got pissed off. He was getting mad and, and you know, I was like, oh, this is kind of odd because he reeled me in a little bit and I was getting a little worked up. I had to put myself in check. So the climax of this guy's conversation, my, our conversation was this. He brought up owning pizza, uh, owning a pizza shop. Well, if I had three employees and they mandated that I increase the minimum wage, I would go in and decide whether I needed to keep those three employees, which pretty much exactly what I said. You're going to need to make a decision. Do I lay off, blah, blah, blah? Do I cut hours back? But he swung it back to, I'm going to decide whether I need... And if I decided I need those three employees to run my business, I'm going to have to make other decisions. And I looked at him, I go, yeah, you're going to raise the price of your pizza. And it was then I actually got up and said, listen, let's agree to disagree. I smiled and walked off. Some people want to be right could care less about being correct. Anyway, back to the grocery store. So, just like a just like a gas tank, I like to keep it topped off when times are bad. And times are by many others considered bad. So, using that uh, metaphor of the gas tank, I go to the grocery store just to get a few things, make sure we got, you know, a little bit milk and whatnot. And I picked up, I really only spent 35 bucks in there. But the real reason going in there was to get a temperature, use it as a barometer, what's going on in my community. Well, things were much worse than they were over the weekend when I last went shopping. And I took some pictures. I am going to show those pictures uh, in this video. Not good at all. Walked all the way to the back where they keep their milk and dairy products. Empty, except for one door which had store brand milk in it. I grabbed one gallon. Turned around, right there is your toilet paper and paper, uh, kitchen paper items. Completely empty. Cleaning items, chemicals. Virtually empty with exception of some of those mops that you put wet towelettes on those kind of mops that you waste of money but that's all that was there in the clean section and maybe some i don't know makeup remover i think i saw a package of makeup remover for women to uh, remove their makeup and all the other items were i would say before there was 50 percent of the store that was empty over the weekend three quarters if not more of the store was empty virtually no canned food items I saw some stewed tomatoes, and that was about it. Zero tuna fish. All the products, including the envelope tuna fish, that's normally more expensive, gone. Peanut butter and jelly, gone with the exception of the small cans of, uh, of jam or jelly. Bread, zero, with the exception of maybe a, a four or five smashed up Hawaiian, uh, though they're in the orange... Um, Packets, a couple of Hawaiian bread things, and some nappy tortillas. They don't even look like real tortillas. They were like a whole wheat, something store on the bottom shelf looked like nobody wanted it yet. Wait till they're starving. Uh, frozen food sections, completely empty with the exception of some box pizzas. Uh, they had plenty of ice cream. They had my ice cream, Hagen does. Um, but pretty much the store was, uh, the food section of this super Walmart was. Uh, uh, virtually empty as far as food. Zero meats, zero chicken. I want to correct myself. I did see a couple of packages of uh, boneless ribeye steaks. 
Uh, I saw a couple of packages of those. Uh, they were like 20 bucks for two steaks, uh, but not very many. Um, they had um, zero chicken, zero pork, no ground beef, zero. I'm talking zero. I got pictures to prove it. Um, but other than that, it was pretty bad. I'm walking down one of the aisles, and I, I kind of pulled over one of the guys and interviewed him. Um, but before I did, I'm walking down, up and down all the aisles. Again, I'm looking. I'm looking and I'm gauging what is going on. What is the pulse of the people? Grocery store is the best barometer of what's going on in your community. One lady's walking by. She's all the way at the, I'm walking from one end of the aisle, just starting up. She's walking towards me from the other end of the aisle. And I can see her, very robotic-like, as she's walking, seeing what's on the shelves. She gets up to me, and as she walks by, this doesn't look like the United States, and she looks at me. And I just shook my head like this. Does not look like the United States, she said. The next aisle I go down, there's a, a man stocking food. The aisle looked empty, so I kind of indulged myself for video's sake. I asked him, hey, hey, how things are going? I see the shelves are empty. However, how is the supply coming into the stores? How are the trucks? Are they coming in on a, on a good schedule? Are the trucks full? He says, we're getting our normal supplies. Our trucks are coming in normal. On a normal schedule, the trucks are full. It's the people that are freaking out, he said. They're, they're, they're overbuying. They're, they're just buying everything they can. And speaking of buying everything they can, here in Tucson, at least where I've gone to, one milk per person. That's what the sign said on the store. I mean, on the glass door. But he said it's the people that are freaking out. Now I'm going to tell you something. I blame it all on the television and radio news. 100% of this. It's been 24 hours, 24-7, coronavirus. They're making it appear as though any day now we're going to be living through an episode of The Walking Dead. They are scaring the people. And it's all for ratings. I know what's going on. What will calm down the people? I think the television news can do it. In one day, they can basically... Excuse me. A little water. A little, little Berkey water. Now, I buy Fuji when I'm in a bind or I'm out, you know, I'm out hiking or something. I buy Fuji water. Good water, too. But this is my Berkey water, and I use the empty containers to put my water in. Ah, clean and cold. That's how I like it. The news. They need to really put a true perspective on this virus. I'm no doctor. I'm not going to sit here and lie that it's all a fraud and blah, 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 blah. But what I do know, the flu kills many more people in the same time frame. We'll just use December 31st as the start of the coronavirus. I could be wrong by a month or so. <clears throat> but I can guarantee you from December 31st till now, more people died worldwide from the flu than the coronavirus. 
It's a fact. But yet, the news needs to come on television and really put this virus into perspective. And I think that in itself will calm the people down. I also want to mention that this has been a learning lesson for non-preppers. Us preppers, us silver stackers, for those reasons alone, we've been mocked. Oh, you stack silver? Oh, you're just a coin collector. Like, 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 what are you, an adult? You collect uh, baseball cards too? I've been mocked because I, I take my money, my cash, my worthless cash, and I turn it into gold and silver. I've been mocked. I've been mocked because I'm a prepper. You've been mocked because you're a prepper. The people who are mocking us are out right now looking for the last can of beans.